this, uh, this topic, we, I, I kind of, every time I deal with this issue, I, sometimes, I think to myself, how do I ever get involved in this, this particular topic that we're dealing with now? And although, um, I guess, on the surface, this topic may not have anything perhaps directly to do with the Alpha and the Omega issue and the changing our religion issue um, that we've been dealing with, yet there is a connection when you look deeper down. And um, it has to do with, and in fact, the, I can't remember what the title was in the brochure. It was The Godhead or something like that. Oh, The God of the Masterful Delusion. Now, the, the reason for choosing that was I wanted to keep people guessing what on earth is this topic about? Is the Godhead a delusion? Well, it depends on how you look at it. It depends on what your theology is regarding the Godhead. And there are a number of different points of view that are floating around today. Um, there are two main camps, though, that I will be dealing with. There are some, some in between as well. But basically, this is the story. Uh, and I'm, I want to give you a little bit of, of a background on what, what the issues are, because there, I know there are many of you who are sitting here today who may have absolutely never have heard of anything to do with this before. And you might wonder why it's even necessary. Well, one of the reasons why it is necessary, because this is something that I have noticed as I've been traveling around the world, and there's some personal experience involved in this as well that I will share with you too. But this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue amongst many people in the Adventist church today. In fact, there are people literally leaving the Seventh-day Adventist church and calling the Seventh-day Adventist church Babylon, and not anymore the remnant church of God because of this issue. And um, I've traveled to Australia, I've traveled to Europe, and there are different speakers going around the world today who are, who are talking to Adventists about this issue and convincing them that we as an, as an Adventist church have become Catholic in our teaching on the Godhead. And um, basically, one point of view says, as I've mentioned, that we've become Catholic on our teaching of the Godhead. In other words, we teach the Catholic Trinity. That's what we are teaching as Adventists. We are not true to what our pioneers taught. Our pioneers taught a different type of theology on the Godhead. They were Arian in their teaching of the Godhead. And basically, in a nutshell, I will get more into detail as we do the presentation, so that you can understand. Um, Arianism basically teaches that Jesus Christ, and this is just very briefly in a nutshell, Jesus Christ is either a created being or was begotten or born of the Father. In other words, he was not there from eternity past with the Father. He came into being somewhere along the line, and of course nobody can set a date or time because nobody knows, but he came into being somewhere along the line, and thus he is not God in the sense that God the Father is God. The Holy Spirit is not a person, or a personality if you like. The Holy Spirit is, we might call it, the force or the essence that comes from God. So it is not an, an, a, a person per se. In, in a nutshell, that is basically the teaching of Arianism. Now, it becomes pretty complex when you look at the doctrine of the Trinity, especially when you start trying to associate what we believe as Adventists in our understanding of, and I use this word very qualifiedly because I, I'm, I'm reticent to use it for reasons that I'll explain later on, when you come to our understanding of the Godhead or the Trinity, as it is, the word is used in some of our published works, more and more so in our present day and age. And it becomes complex because there are different versions of the Trinity doctrine. There is not just the Catholic version of the Trinity doctrine. And we have to ask ourselves the question when we look at this, do we as Seventh-day Adventists teach the Catholic Trinity or the Catholic belief on the Godhead? And so it is necessary for us to look into the different semantics of this whole issue. And as, I, as I've stated, you have probably heard in my prayer that this is, and, and, and my statements in the beginning about saying, as I said, I don't know how I got involved in this, because it's a landmine issue. There is just so much involved in this, in fact, of the very many different kinds of issues that I have gotten involved in and, and studied into over the years. This one is, is the one that really just bowls you over. One of the reasons why is because there seems to be so much clear evidence. In fact, when I read the the documentation of the folk 
who are accusing the Seventh-day Adventist Church of being Catholic in their teaching of the Trinity and that we are not true to our pioneers' belief, a more Aryan view on the Godhead. When I read the documentation, how they've used the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, etc., etc., when you read the documentation without actually doing a deeper study into this, you can be convinced that they are absolutely right in what they are saying. Really. It is... There were times when I read this and I said, well, there seems to be no argument against this. But on the other hand, I said to myself, it cannot be that we as Seventh-day Adventists are teaching a doctrine of the Catholic Church. Because then I read other statements by Ellen White that seemed to say exactly the opposite to what they were using from the Spirit of Prophecy to support their um, Aryan belief in the Godhead and their accusations that we are teaching the Catholic doctrine. And so it's taken me literally months, and in some cases, some of the concepts, years of research and study to actually come to the conclusions which I've come. And I'm going to share with you as much as I can in the time that we have today, these conclusions. Maybe I can start off by sharing with you a few statements that Ellen White made regarding the book, The Living Temple, that John Harvey, that uh, Kellogg wrote. Now, this is with regards to the nature of God and the personality of God. Now, although there may not be some specific things happening today in this controversy between the, the so-called Trinity and the, the whole Godhead issue, there are certain things that we can get out of what Ellen White says here that can be applied. And another reason, uh, might just as a sideline, another reason why I want to share this presentation, although on the surface it's not really connected to the Alpha Omega issue, is because some of, the, some of the issues we are facing today in the church might come from mainstream Adventism. This issue of the Trinity Godhead thing does not necessarily come from mainstream Adventism. This is a certain group within the church. In fact, many of them are not really, strictly speaking, Adventists anymore. Some of them even come from the Reform Adventist movement but that are instigating this thing. But yet, we cannot only look at some of the things that are coming from within the church. We also have to look at things that are coming sometimes from outside and because there are dangers coming in from there as well. And um, one of the results of this, this uh, controversy with the Trinity Godhead thing is that it leads people away from the church. In fact, in most cases where I've come into contact with this issue, it causes people to ultimately call the Seventh-day Adventist Church Babylon. It is not the remnant church of God anymore, and that we shouldn't be a part of it because of what we believe as far as the Godhead is concerned. But let me share these statements, and I'll make a few comments as I read them from first selected messages. Edomite writes, the living temple contains the alpha of these theories. I knew that the Omega would follow in a little while, and I trembled for our people. And now this is the part that I want to highlight. I knew that I must warn our brethren and sisters not to enter into controversy over the presence and personality of God. Warn our brethren not to enter into controversy over the presence and personality of God. Then she goes on to speak with reference to the living temple. The statements made in the living temple in regard to this point are incorrect. The scripture used to substantiate the doctrine there set forth is scripture misapplied. Now the reason why I highlighted this section is that it's not only in the context of Kellogg and the Living Temple where they were getting into a controversy or discussion over the, or an opinion over the personality and the presence of God, but it can also happen in other contexts as well. And I see this happening in the controversy about the Trinity or the Godhead. Another statement she made with regards to uh, the living temple had to do with spiritualistic theory. Now, I have discovered in my studies into the Trinitarian gospel, as I've looked at the Catholic Trinity, as I've looked at Arianism, as I've looked at what we teach the Seventh-day Adventists, that there are definitely strong elements of spiritualism that come into this, although not the same types of elements as you might, when you superficially look at it, see in the living temple, there are nonetheless elements of spiritualism that are involved there as well. And she writes, the spiritualistic theories regarding the personality of God followed to their logical conclusion sweep away the whole Christian economy. They estimate as nothing the light that Christ came from heaven to give John to give to his people. They teach that the scenes just before us are not of sufficient importance to be given special attention. They make, they make of no effect the truth of heavenly origin and rob the people of God of their past experience, giving them, in, giving them instead a false 
science. I do believe that if we are to follow some of the theories and ideas that people are propagating today regarding the Godhead, in contradiction to what we really believe as Seventh-day Adventists, what I believe is based on this proto-prophecy, we are, without realizing it, getting into a form of spiritualistic theology, if I may use the term, regarding the personality of God. She also says, we are now to be on God and not drawn away from the all-important message given of God for this time. Satan is not ignorant of the result of trying to define God and Jesus Christ in a spiritualistic, and of course, yeah, it is used in reference to a system of interpretation, not spiritism, popularly called spiritualism. It's basically the spiritualistic way that sets God and Christ as non, a non-entity. And then she goes on to speak about the moments occupied in this kind of science are in the place of preparing the way of the Lord, making a way for Satan to come in to confuse the minds with mysticism of his own devising. And there are certainly mystical aspects involved in what we are going to be dealing with this afternoon. Although they are dressed up in angels' robes, they have made our God and our Christ a non-entity. And in a sense, when one follows what is being taught today regarding this teaching of the Godhead that is in opposition to what we, what we believe as Adventism, we are definitely actually placing Christ as a non-entity, not to mention what they do with the Holy Spirit, etc. We are forbidden, now this is also an important part that, I, that I'd like to make reference to, because of course this is in the context of conjecturing and getting into discussion about the personality uh, of God. He says we are forbidden to set the imagination in a train of conjecture. And a lot of what I see today coming out of these teachings that are coming to the Adventist Church regarding the Godhead stroke Trinity are largely based on conjecture. And uh, it'll become clearer as we continue. She told the audience, this is Willie White writing, um, or as he is quoted in 5 um, Biography 331, she told the audience that silence was eloquence when it came to discussing God what he is and where he is. When you are tempted, this is Ellen White now being quoted, when you are tempted to speak of what God is, keep silence, because as surely as you begin to speak of this, you will disparage him. And one of the reasons why I think Ellen White said this, because there is so much, and I want to make this very clear, there is so much about the Godhead, about the person of Christ, about God that is a mystery to you and I. And there are people that are trying to go so deeply into dissecting these things that they are going beyond what God has actually revealed. And this is where I find one of the biggest dangers is. So when it comes to certain things that we cannot explain as human beings, don't conjecture about it. Don't get into discussions about it. But rather just be silent because we will disparage God in the process of trying to do these things. Now, having said that, I want to go into the actual presentation that we are going to do. Now, maybe some of my own personal experience might be helpful, first of all. I came back from a trip to, uh, it was England at the time, and just prior to that, I'd been on a trip to Australia. And in Australia, a number of people had approached me, and I'd heard rumblings about this, this issue um, regarding the Trinity stroke Godhead and the controversy going on about it. But I always thought, well, this is not something that's really that significant, and I've not spent enough time looking into it. I went to England, and some group of people came to me and started speaking to me about this issue. What do you believe rega regarding the Godhead? What do you believe regarding the Trinity? Do you know that if you have the point of view that we believe as Seventh-day Adventists today, that you are actually Catholic in your view? And I thought, oh, wow. Well, I said, I, it's a non-issue for me. Went home. After I came back from England, my head elder came to me and he said to me, listen, we've got a major problem in the church. We need to get together and talk. I said, well, what's the big problem? What's the issue? He said, well, um, people in, the, in our congregation, there are a few of them, and, and they are distributing materials around the congregation that they have actually, uh, they've actually accused the Seventh-day Adventist Church of being Babylon in what we believe regarding the Godhead, that we are not the remnant church of God anymore, that we teach a doctrine that is not faithful to what our pioneers believe, and that we are Catholic in what we believe. And a number of people have latched onto this. So I said, oh boy, I've just been hearing about this overseas, and now you're telling me this is at home in our church as well. 
So we got together and I started reading up and studying on some of these things and we had a few meetings, the elders had a few meetings and eventually we decided we'd go and visit the folk in our congregation and talk to them. They'd been absolutely faithful Adventists right until this point in time. They'd, they'd come into the church, been baptized. Some of them were involved as, as uh, leaders in Sabbath school. Some of them were, were, were um, deacons, head deacons in our church and so on. And um, we decided to go talk to them. Once I went to visit the people and spoke to them, I realized this was pretty serious stuff. Because the group, the main leaders in the group, there were three of them, turned around to me and said, look, we are actually willing that if it came to that, that we would leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church, cut our membership ties with the Seventh-day Adventist Church if something is not done about this and we don't actually correct what we are doing. And so I said, well, I have to get deeper into this. And so I started studying and researching and studying and researching because we had to eventually give a presentation for our congregation because the whole congregation had been given this material to read. And there were people that were asking questions like, well, should I stay in the church or should I leave the church? Are we really Catholic in what we believe? And so finally I gave the presentation much of what I'm going to share with you today. But I might just say that you cannot deal with this issue in one hour. So I'm going to give you an overview of this and try and give you the essence and some of the main points that I feel are problem areas um, so that you can see for yourself what it is about because I have no doubt in my mind that sooner or later you will come into contact with this. It is an issue that is sweeping the Adventist church. The result, anyway, what happened in our home church, this is my personal experience with this. The result was after we gave the presentation, a number of the people came to their senses and said, whoa, we see what's happening here. But unfortunately, two of the people that were involved in this thing one of them has now officially written to our conference and said, I want to withdraw my membership from the Adventist Church. I don't want anybody to contact me or in any way try and persuade me otherwise. Stay away from me. I believe the church is Babylon. It's not the remnant church of God. And that's the result of this issue. One of the, that, in other words, that's a fruit. And for me, fruits are one of the most important indications as to whether something is from God or not. By the fruits you will know. Does it lead you to con condemn God's church and and call it something that it is not. And the other person right now that is, as I speak, the other person right now is in the process of considering whether they also are going to withdraw the membership. There is another one who says they are not, but they are still studying into this issue, and I just hope that they won't go over the deep end with it. So I have personal experience with this. One of the problems I have with trying to get into things that, and of course we read the statements that Ellen White made warning people not to get into discussions about this, Certain things are a mystery to us. And I, I asked the question in the, in, when I spoke to some of the folk regarding this, and that was, there is a danger in trying to explain what we as human beings cannot fully understand. In other words, can we as human beings fully conceive the eternal existence of God? How do you explain that? I mean, we have the words. God existed from eternity. We cannot, we cannot allocate a time to when he came into existence. But can we understand that? Have you ever sat down and tried to think about that? You can actually drive yourself nuts by thinking about existing forever and ever that there's no, that you can't explain it. I remember once as a kid I sat down trying to think about this and I literally thought I was going to go mad. And so I've avoided doing that. <laughs> Maybe I'm just more prone to insanity than most people, I don't know. But it can drive you nuts, believe me. And we cannot fully understand this. And so when the Bible speaks about Jesus Christ as being the only, but this is one of the arguments that I use, by the way. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the begotten Son of God. We read about it in John 3, verse 16. For God gave His only begotten Son. Now, but yet the Bible also speaks about Jesus as being there from eternity. Ellen White writes about it over and over again, that He's the self-existent uh, one who has, has underived life. In other words, He didn't get it from anywhere else. His life was there originally in Him. It exists. I'll share those statements as we continue. But how do we actually understand these things when we speak about Christ as being only begotten but still being there from all eternity? What does it mean? So what these people have done is they have tried to explain things and try to formulate some theology about this when they don't really have the answer either from the Bible or the Spirit of Prophecy. Not in clear terms. So the best for us to do is to actually only deal with those things that are clearly revealed and let the rest be a mystery until God actually reveals it to us. Another one, do you understand? Can you explain the omniscience of God, His omnipresence? 
how he can be in, in, in all places at all times and see all things. Now, we understand what it means. We have the words for it. But how does it actually function and work in reality? In our, with our three-dimensional, puny little minds, we simply cannot understand and explain things like this. Yet, we want to try and explain what the Godhead is exactly about. How Jesus came into existence. Exactly what the Holy Spirit is as far as his person, etc. is concerned. When the Word of God does not give us all of that information, it gives us enough for us to have a knowledge of God, but the rest remains a mystery. How can we explain how God can hold the whole universe in sway? How do you explain that? If he is a person, and Jesus is a person, and the Holy Spirit is a person, as we believe as Seventh-day Adventists, um, how are they able to hold all of this stuff together? There are certain things that are absolute mysteries to us. How can God dwell in us and we dwell in Him? It sounds like such a simple thing. But how can God dwell in every single individual human being living on the face of this planet? How does He do it? Oh, through His Spirit. But how does it work? How is it possible for something like, we cannot comprehend it, we have to accept that this is a fact, it happens, and this is what God does. But how do we explain that? Not even science can explain it to you. It is a mystery, but we accept it on faith. God has told us that it is so. But yet, people try to explain the Godhead. I mean, we cannot fully understand and explain Jesus, Jesus, um, personality and life when he came here down to this earth. We cannot fully understand all the implications. And while also says there's a mystery in that and we shouldn't even get into discussion about that. So how are we going to explain something which, which happened eons and eons ago in eternity past between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? How are we going to understand those things? And so my problem is that what these people are doing is they are trying to talk about things that they really have no knowledge of. It's conjecture at its very best. But the doctrine concerning the Godhead, otherwise known as the doctrine of the Trinity, of course, in the Greek it's Trinitas, the triunity, or the three-in-oneness, as it is known, is one of, one could say, probably one of the most foundational and important doctrines of Christianity. However, in recent times, some Seventh-day Adventists have, be, have come to question whether we really are teaching it correctly. And so, at the 1995 General Conference in Utrecht in Holland, a man by the name of Fred Alabak distributed a paper there amongst the people that were gathered for the general conference. And the paper was entitled, No New Leaders, No New Gods. And in this paper he makes this claim, and I quote, he makes the claim that Seventh -day, the Seventh-day Adventist Church did not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity until long after the death of Ellen G. White. Now it is true that the, that the Seventh-day Adventists did not use the term Trinity, until long after. But this has got to do with an understanding of what we believe as, with regards to the Trinity and what the Catholics believe. Anyway, he goes on to say, he says, the Adventist pioneers believed that in the eons of eternity only one divine being existed. Then, this one divine being had a son. Begotten, created, born, in fact, they... There's an interesting thing here, because amongst some of the people who have the Aryan doctrine, they either will tell you that Jesus is a created being, and they use Revelation chapter, um, chapter 3, to, in the beginning of the Laodicean message, it says, Jesus, the first of the creation of God, to substantiate, and there are some other texts in the Bible that they use as well. Some believe that he was created, some of them believe that he was either created or begotten or born of God, and some say, no, he was not created, he was just begotten of God or born of God. How that actually happened, well, I guess is anybody's guess. But Yari is basically saying that the Adventist pioneers believed that there was one divine being that existed, and then somewhere in time past, he gave birth to, as it were, a son, which was Jesus God. That's why Jesus is called the only begotten of the Father. And so he says, thus Christ had a beginning. And of course, in regards to the Holy Spirit, Alabak believes that, and I quote, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God and Christ not another divine being. In other words, he is not in essence God, he is just the essence of God. He also goes on to say, oh, by the way, there are others also as well, Bill Stringfellow, Rachel Corrie Alan Stump, you may be familiar with some of these guys who are also propagating many of these teachings. Stringfellow makes this interesting comment. He says, 
Just think there was a certain specific day when God brought forth his son. Way, way back, one beautiful historic day. There was a time, even though it is impossible to think that far back into the past, when Christ did not exist. Interesting. Now, of course, officially today, we are t- and by, let me first state that there are definitely, there, there definitely is evidence that many of our pioneers held to this type of idea in different degrees. But the point I'd like to make, though, and I'll, I'll share this with you as we continue when we, when we look at the, the, the history behind what we believed in our early pioneers day, pioneer days of Seventh-day Adventists, the point that I will make is that it is not really what they are trying to describe here that they believed, and that there was a change that took place in Adventism with regards to this. We have to understand that many of our pioneers came from many different denominations and churches, some erring in belief, some otherwise, and they brought with them some of that baggage. In fact, many of our beliefs that we had underwent changes as we continued and grew and as God gave us more light. I'll make more comment about that um, as we continue. In fact, the statement is made that if many of our pioneers were alive today, they would be opposed to our present teaching, our Adventist teaching on the Godhead. Okay, so let's get into the actual issue that is involved. And I'd like to look at a definition, first of all, a dictionary definition of the word Trinity, or Trinitas as it is known in the Latin. The concise Oxford Dictionary, the seventh edition, speaking of the word Trinity, this is how it describes it, being three, a group of three, a union of three persons in one Godhead. Yet for me is an interesting, I could guess you could call it a problem, because on the one hand, when you read the Catholic definition of the Trinity or the Godhead, they give the description given here in the Oxford Dictionary. They tell you that there is a union of three persons in one Godhead. But how they extrapolate that whole idea and how they then get to explain what exactly this means is very different from what Seventh-day Adventists say when when we say that, yes, it is a union of three persons in one Godhead. The explanation or the description of this is completely different. I will make, make that point very clearly as we continue. In the Chambers 20th Century Dictionary of the 1936 printing, again, the word Trinity, a union of three in one Godhead, or the persons of the Godhead. So that's a dictionary definition. As far as Arianism is concerned, just a little bit of background and history. So I'm just dealing with some of the terminology at the moment. A teaching, the teaching of Arianism arose in the 4th century AD in the city of Alexandria, which was, of course, a very important center of learning. And there were, in fact, well, before I mention that, the guy who was involved in this, and that's the term Arianism, was a man by the name of Arius, who was a presbyter of Alexandria. And basically, the belief of the Arians in that time was that it denied that Jesus Christ was of the same substance as the Father and um, reduced the Son of God to the rank of a creature, in other words, a created being. And this is, of course, where Arianism gets its teaching from. There were two schools of thought back in that time. There was the church, there was the, the, was the, uh, there was the school in Alexandria, and there was the school in Antioch. It is interesting to notice, though, and I often highlight this particular point because the people in Antioch chose to use a more exegetical approach in their study of the Word of God, which means that they allowed the Word of God to explain itself. On the other hand, the people in Alexandria used a more allegorical approach in their theology. One of the people that was, uh, was Oregon, who was one of the, one of the teachers in, in Alexandria, and um, he read, for example, into the parables of Christ certain things that Christ never intended through his allegorical approach of interpretation. It's also interesting to notice that the, ad- that the, um, that the adherence of the, of the uh, exegetical approach um, basically allowed the revelation of the Word of God, the Word of God to speak for itself. Now, something I might highlight, of course, here at this point, and this is why I mentioned these things. I nearly got sidetracked there for a moment. The reason why I mentioned these things is that this idea of Arianism came out of the Alexandrian school, whereas it seems to be that the folk in Antioch were more true to what we, the methodology that we as Adventists use in our interpretation of Scripture. Of course, there were not only the 
hard, if we might call it a hardcore Arians, there were also the semi-Arians that tried to find some kind of compromise between the teaching of the Trinity that was developing at that time and uh, because it had not yet fully come into, its, into being as it is found in Catholicism at that time in um, 325 AD or 400 in the 4th century AD. Try to find some compromise between the two. Then, then, of course, the, then, of course, there is the teaching of Trinitarianism. Now, this is a little more complex because the word Trinity, strictly speaking, is not Catholic, although it is now today associated with the Catholic Church. But in its origins, before the Catholic Church ever existed, the word Trinity came into being, and in a different form, though. The word trios was the word used, and it was found, it was first used by Theophilus of Antioch back in AD 180. Interestingly enough, in the Antioch school, it was used by Theophilus in AD 180, where he speaks of the Trinity of God the Father. And um, then also, later on, we find the term coming into form in its Latin, in, in its Latin, Trinitas, and a man by the name of Tertullian was the one who is one of the early people who used that, that uh, terminology. Um, and it is also found in the writings of Oregon as well, where he writes about the Trinity. But this is interesting to me, because when you go to the writings of Oregon and you see how he writes about the Trinity, it is not the same perspective on the Trinity as you find with some of the people like Theophilus, for example, of Antioch. It has a different, a different angle to it. In fact, the teachings of, of Oregon on the Trinity are basically some of the ideas and concepts that we find later on in the Catholic teaching of the Trinity. And there is, as you will discover, elements of Arianism in their Trinitarian teaching. I will give you their own statements in a moment. In other words, what happened was, and this is what Satan often does, is he gives you two extremes in order to bring those two extremes together to where he actually wants you to be. On the one hand, you had Arianism. On the other hand, you had this Trinitarian doctrine that was developing. So you had the thesis and the antithesis. And what Satan did was to try and bring the two doctrines together to create a synthesis. And that is what you find ultimately in the Catholic teaching of the Trinity, the synthesis of these two ideas, a combination of the concepts of the Trinitarian doctrine and the, and the concepts of the Arian teaching. I will have a bit more to say that in a moment. One of, one of the students of Oregon, a man by the name of Gregory Thaumaturgus, writes in his, I, this is Greek, well, this is Latin rather, Ethesis Tespestios, he writes, there is therefore nothing created, nothing subject to another in the Trinity, nor is there anything that has been added as though it once had not existed, but it entered afterwards. Therefore the Father has never been without the Son, nor the Son without the Spirit, and this same Trinity is immutable and unalterable forever. Now this is quoted in the Catholic Encyclopedia, but how you understand the Catholic view or how you Interpret the Catholic view of the statement makes all the difference. And so let's go to the official Vatican website and see what they have to say. And I will share various statements from this. Point 262, I'm, gonna, I'm only going to share the most important points because there's a heck of a lot that they have to say on this. I'm going to highlight this. In the Father and with the Father, the Son is one and the same God. Now, it sounds like it could be right. In the Father, though, this is what is important, in the Father and with the Father, the Son is one and the same God. Now, does, do they mean that Jesus Christ is a separate person? Or do they believe in some strange way that there is a blending, we could call it a biological blending, if you like, for want of a better term, between the Father and the Son? What do they mean? We'll get to that in a moment. I'm asking these questions as we give the statements, Okay. Because you will then discover whether Catholicism is really teaching Arianism or whether it's teaching Trinitarianism as we believe it. And I might also just say that I, I use the, the term Trinity qualifiedly because, um, strictly speaking, Adventists never used the term Trinity until later on in the 20th century. We never used the term Trinity. It was a term that only came into being. In fact, there was probably a, not that there was a problem with using the term Trinity, but because it was so closely associated with Catholicism, people started saying, you, you're adopting the Catholic doctrine by using the terminology of Trinity. The other one regarding the Spirit. The Spirit is one and the same God. But how you understand that makes all the difference, and we will see in a moment. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father 
as the first principle and by the eternal gift of this to the Son from the communion of both the Father and the Son. In other words, the Spirit of God is not a person in the sense that the Father and the Son are a person. And let's go to some other Catholic views. Now this comes from um, Lawrence Lever Morrow, a bishop, the Bishop of Krishnagar, in his book entitled, One in Three Persons, My Catholic Faith. Now you will get to understand what they really believe when you read in the outlines of their official Vatican website what their teaching on the Trinity is. Well, to get an understanding, go to some of the other writings and there you get a clearer understanding of what the Catholics really believe. And so I quote from Bishop Krishnaga. He says, God the Father eternally knows himself. You'll understand what this means in a moment. God the Father eternally knows himself and continues to know himself and thus continues to bring forth the Son in a continual birth. So, Jesus is produced by the Father all the time. If it wasn't for this continual... In fact, in some, in some statements I've heard, basically it says that the Father copulates with himself. That's essentially what it means. The Son proceeds... This is from the Catholic Encyclopedia, a 1914 edition. The Son proceeds from the Father, the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. In other words, He emanates from them. He is not an, a person in and of Himself. So when they speak about the three persons of the Godhead, this is what they mean. They don't mean what we mean when we speak about the three persons of the Godhead. You get what I'm saying? Okay. So when the Arians who believe in the Arian doctrine are accusing Seventh-day Adventists of being Catholic in their teaching, they don't actually know what the Catholics really believe. And this is what they actually believe. Secondly, I continue to share with you, the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Christ. He is also the Spirit of the Father. Thus, St. Augustine argues, just as there is only one Father, just as there is only one Son, so there is only one Spirit, who is consequently the Spirit of both. Such is the explicit teaching of ecclesiastical tradition, etc., etc. Tertullian dwells at length, and this again comes from the Catholic Encyclopedia, on the Paraclete. The Holy Ghost, he says, proceeds from the Father through the Son. Again, just the, the, the same statement, but said in a different way. Some of the Church Fathers believed, in proof of this assertion, of the belief of the Church Fathers, they deny the equality of the Son with the Father. And then passages are cited from Justin and so on. Expressions which contain the statement that the Son was created are found in Clement of Alexandria and so on. And then they quote this as some of the sources that gave rise to their belief on the, on, uh, the relationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In a nutshell, what this basically is saying is that Jesus is a created being. In other words, he was not essentially there. With, and even if he was there from the beginning, he came forth from the Father. In other words, the Catholic Church was blending Arianism doctrine that Jesus was, came as a, the begotten or born of God with the concept of what the Christian Church believed in the early years and that Jesus was there always with God as a separate individual. They blended the two ideas. In other words, Catholics took the concept of Oregon and the existence uh, from the Arians and then the terminology applied to the Godhead of the Trinitarians and came up with the Catholic Trinity. That's essentially what happened. A combination of the two ideas. Thus, they kept the Christians happy by seeming to promote their understanding of the Godhead, and they also kept the pagans happy by supporting their theology on what they believed God, the God, or the God power was all about. Because essentially, the Arian doctrine is a spiritualistic doctrine. It is not a Christian doctrine. So now we go to the early Adventist church. The terminology used by Ellen White and found in general Adventist literature, this is what you mostly hear Ellen White using and in early Adventist literature, either the term Godhead or the heavenly trio, which gives the concept of three. Ellen White uses that in a number of statements. And the eternal heavenly dignitaries. We will share some of those statements um, of hers as we continue. Of course, there are a few others in Ellen White's writings as well, but these are the three main ones that you will come into contact with. Now, our early Adventist pioneers. It is said by those who are accusing the Adventist church today that we teach the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity and that our early Adventist pioneers were against the teaching of the Trinity. And yes, they were. But exactly what was it that they were against? Were they against what we teach regarding the Godhead or were they against what the Catholic teach teach? Uh, regarding the Godhead? That's the question. And so, 
I quote to you a statement that comes from James White in 1855. I'll quote to you from James White and Joseph Bates and from Loughborough as well. I'll highlight some of their points that they make regarding their issue with the Trinity. Now remember, in the early church, Adventist church, we didn't use the term Trinity because we were trying to distinguish ourselves from the Catholic Church. I must say, personally, I feel that there was a mistake that we made in bringing the term Trinity in. Not that it is in and of itself wrong, but automatically people associated us with the Catholic Church by doing that. Okay, so James White made this statement, published in a Review and Herald article back in 1855, which was entitled Preach the Word. And Yari says, and I quote, we might mention the Trinity. Now notice their problem was with the Catholic Trinity because in the statement he speaks about the Catholic Trinity, which, notice what it says, does away with the personality of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. So James White firmly believed what I was trying to share with you today regarding what the Catholics believed, that there is a strange, peculiar blending of the Father and the Son and that they are not specifically persons on their own. The Catholic Trinity, he says, does away with the personality of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Which means that James White was actually had a problem with some of the, would have had a problem with some of the views that Aaron's are teaching regarding the Godhead, because it does away with the personality of the Father and the Son. Another statement from Joseph Bates, written in 1868, he says, Respecting the Trinity, I concluded that it was impossible for me to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, was also the Almighty. God the Father, now listen, one and the same being. You see, you've got to understand what they are reading. He's not saying that I have a problem with the fact that Jesus was a person and that God was a person. I have a problem with what the Catholics teach, because he also had a problem like James White did with the Catholic Trinity. My problem is, is that they are teaching that, the pers that um, Jesus Christ and God are actually blended in some strange way as being one and the same being. Loughborough writes about this as well, and I'd like to share well, a, a fair section of his statement here regarding his objections to the Catholic Trinity. He says, These positions I will remark upon briefly in their order. It is not very consonant in agreement with common sense, in other words, to talk of three being one and one being three, or as some express it, calling God the triune God. But why? Because he is looking at the Catholic Trinity. That is why. He says, if the Father and Son and Holy Ghost are each God, it would be three gods. For three times one is not one, but three. And then he makes a very important statement, and this is to understand the essence of what he is saying. And by the way, out of these three men, I get the impression that Lofro was more Aaron, if you like, than the other brethren were. And this is what he says. There is a sense in which they are one, but not one person. So he's getting right to the heart of what the Catholics believe, like James White did, like Joseph Bates did. The problem is, is their understanding of the Trinity in which there's a blending of the Father and the Son, and that the Father, as we read in that statement, continually gives birth to the Son. There are other statements I could read. In fact, there were some of the early brethren who were definitely Aaron, specifically Aaron in their belief. And my, my contention is this, is that even if, the brethren were Aaron in their belief, does it mean that we as Adventists today are wrong because we are not teaching what the early brethren taught regarding the Godhead? I'm saying this just for a point of argument's sake. Are we necessarily wrong? No, not necessarily, because there were many things that the early brethren believed which later on changed. I'll give you one example. Um, a lot of the early brethren, when they came to the church, used to chew tobacco, some of them. Some of them used to eat meat. They were not vegetarian in their lifestyle. There were many things that they did. Some of them ate pork and so on. But as the Lord gave light, they changed many of the things which they did. Many of the brethren in the early, in the early days of the church had more of a tendency to believe in salvation by works than salvation through faith in God. Righteousness by faith message was given in 1888. Many of the early brethren, like Uriah Smith being one of them, did not want to accept that message. Did it mean that we should be true to what our pioneers believed, or did it mean that God had given us light that we need, now need to grow, take and grow with and accept? So if we really want to go back to all that the pioneers believed, maybe we should go back to the pre-righteousness by faith message that they had and believe in salvation by works rather than the righteousness by faith message. 
we would, we, would, we would actually, by doing that, become more Catholic than Seventh-day Adventists because they teach in salvation by works. So the fact of the matter is, even if the brethren believed something, does not necessarily mean that they were right in what they believed just because they happened to be pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I, I just say that for sake of argument because I don't think we fully understand what problem they had with the Trinity. It was not with what we believe, it was with, with, with what the Catholics taught in their position on the Trinity. Okay. Of course, there were a number of statements over the years that Adventists made regarding the um, aspect of the Godhead. In the, in the 1889 Seventh-day Adventist yearbook, there was a statement that came out on the fundamental beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists, largely for the benefit of those who were not Adventists. In fact, the statement here on the Godhead was not actually that clear. Um, it was only printed twice afterwards, and they reprinted something else on the Godhead back in November 1889. But then... In 1898, a breakthrough came with Ellen White's articles that she wrote on the Godhead. And she made some very interesting statements that would seem to fly in the face of what people are saying today regarding um, Ellen White's teaching. And because of these statements, some of them are to be found in evangelism, particularly with regard to the Holy Spirit, they are because they have no other ammunition, they are saying, well, actually, Ellen White's writings have been manipulated and changed over the years, and she never actually wrote that. Now, I did, when I gave the seminar in my church, just to help some of the people in my, in my congregation with this issue, I actually took facsimile copies of the original Review and Herald articles. In fact, you get a whole series of books of the Signs of the Times and Review and Herald, where you have the original facsimile copies of the articles as they were written. And I put them on the screen to say, because the folk were saying, that's not what Ellen White said. And I said, okay, here it is, the facsimile. In fact, that's not what, I'm, what I want to show you. Anyway, here it, is, the, here it is, the facsimile copy of the original Review and Herald article. And this is what Ellen White said, and I showed them from the screen, what she said. Basically, Ellen White's statements were, and this was written in the Signs of the Times. Many of these concepts were later on also. In fact, very soon after that, in 1898, when the Desire of Ages came out, people read about this in the Desire of Ages as well. And after quoting John um, 10, verses 18, where Jesus says this, he says, No one takes it life from me, but I lay it down of myself. She then says this, and these are the statements as they are found in these articles. Um, in him, with reference to Jesus Christ, was life original, unborrowed, and underived. Now, that's simple English. Yet I find that these people try all sorts of incredible contortionist um, activities to try and get around this clear, simple statement in English. In Jesus was life original, unborrowed, underived. Look up the dictionary definition of those words. Underived means he didn't get it from anywhere else. It was in him from the beginning. She goes on to say, the light of life, she quotes Jesus' answer to the Jews. She says, most assuredly I say unto you, this is John 8 verse 58, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then she makes this interesting comment. She says, Silence fell upon the vast assembly, the name of God given to Moses to express the idea of the eternal presence had been claimed as his own by this Galilean rabbi. He announced himself to be what? This is an understanding of what the term I am actually means. He pronounced himself to be the self-existent one. In other words, the one who existed by himself, not from the Father, not coming through some strange kind of continual reproduction from the Father. He existed from himself from the very beginning. He who had been promised to Israel, whose goings forth had been from of old, from the days of eternity. And then she goes on to say, again, in the Desire of Ages, in Christ is life original, unborrowed, and underived. Another statement which she makes in that same article, she says, he was equal with God, infinite and omnipotent. He is the eternal self-existing Son. What exactly do we mean? Now, what they try to say is, there it is, you see. He is the eternal self-existing Son. Now, they don't try to explain the self-existing eternal part, but they take the term Son out and say, if He's the Son, He must have been begotten. Because John 3, verse 16, another place in Scripture, speak about Jesus as being the only begotten Son of God. So, now, there are many today in Adventism who will teach, and I think rightfully so. God knew from the very beginning what would happen. 
Now, we don't know how God came into existence. I don't even want to try and give you my concepts or ideas on this because I think this would just be my own imagination. But when God and Christ came into existence and the Holy Spirit, somewhere back in eons of time, they knew, because God is all-knowing, He knew the future beginning from the end all, the, all right through. I mean, He saw from the very beginning what, what was happening all the way through till our day and age and far beyond. So Christ knows everything. They knew about what would happen. They knew about sin. They knew it would be necessary to have a Redeemer come to this world. And so Jesus was given the title from the very beginning as the Son of God because that would be one of the roles that He would fulfill in His ministry, in His work. In fact, there are many different labels that are given to Christ, many different things that describe His different functions, functions to the Holy Spirit and so on. So this is a term that was given to Christ that was finally fulfilled if you like, when he came to this world and was born of Mary and became, if one might say, yes, really then, in biological terms, if you like, and I say that qualifiedly, the Son of God. It is also interesting to notice later on that we started printing, I think it was back in 1931? Yes. In 1931, Point 22 of our statement on fundamental beliefs was the first time when we, on an official basis, used the word Trinity to describe the Godhead. And uh, interestingly enough, though, it was taken out again in the 1981 fundamental beliefs as it was printed, and uh, it was not used. But when you read it, even in the, even in the 1931 issue of our fundamental beliefs, when, when you extrapolate uh, our whole belief on the Trinity or Godhead, it is not what the Catholics believe. And that's the point I'm trying to make, is that those who are teaching this Arian Trinity doctrine and saying that we are teaching the Catholic Trinity are not taking time to actually just research and discover whether we are really teaching what the Catholics teach or whether we are teaching that's something that is not Arian, it is not Catholic, but it is just simply true to the light that the Lord has given us. That's all it is, simple, clear, and plain. Now, I don't want to go over all the major arguments. In fact, I don't know if I've had an hour already. Not yet. I, I can just carry on, right? Okay. I don't want to go through all the different arguments that are used by the Arians or by those who are arguing this point with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but I'd like to share some of the main points. Some of them I've already highlighted, but just by way of summary, before I actually get into... This is actually the meat that I'm going to get into now. This is just a preamble that I've been giving you. I'm sorry, but that's, that's a very involved issue. Okay, point number one. <laughs> Do you want to stretch your legs? The Bible does not teach the concept of the Catholic Trinity. The word Trinity is not used in the Bible or by Ellen White. Point number one of the argument. Point number two, the Bible teaches that there is only one God that we should worship. This God is the Father. We break, this is a very important argument of them, theirs, that we break the first four commandments if we worship a Trinitarian concept of God. The, the Catholic Trinity, which of course really is Arianism dressed up in a different form. So if anybody's Catholic in their teaching, it's the Arians. But they don't realize that. And the next point is, the Holy Spirit is not a person, is not God, but proceeds from the Father and the Son, which is essentially a Catholic teaching. Our pioneers are Aaron and anti-Catholic, were Aaron and anti-Catholic in their belief. Ellen White's writings were manipulated and changed after her death so that they would reflect the Catholic or pagan Trinity dogma. dogma. Finally, this means that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not the remnant church of God. This is the final point that you'll get to. But it is part of Babylon. If we want to remain pure in our faith, then we need to go back to our roots, and um, this may mean leaving the Seventh-day Adventist Church to finally become the true remnant of God. So that's the remnant that leaves the remnant to become the remnant. And who knows, there might be another one after that as well. Now, let's dissect some of the points of the Aaron position. And by, to do that, what I want to do is I want to go to the biblical terms that are used for Christ. In fact, in just a few verses, you don't have to get deeply involved in this, but in just a few verses, you can actually sweep away very effectively the basic foundation of this Arian teaching, that Jesus is not God in essential terms. Let's listen. The word for God that is used in Exodus 3, verses 14, where it says, and I quote what the text says, it says, and God, and this is what I want to deal with, God says to Moses when he's at the burning bush, I am that I am, and he said, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent you. Now the term that is used there for God is the term Elohim, which basically means, essentially, translating it into English, means the supreme God Almighty. 
Now that means this is the God that is supreme. Above anything else, this is the supreme God, the I Am, the God of Israel, the Elohim. In Exodus, now this is interesting, because they spoke about the fact that we are breaking the first four commandments. Now listen what happens when you go to the commandments. In Exodus 20, verses 2, you read, I am the Lord, that's the word we're looking at right now, thy God, and that's the term Elohim which is used, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now when we worship a trinity God, they say we're worshipping more than one God, so we're having other gods before God. Okay? Now the word Lord that is used here, with the word Elohim, God, that he, uh, stay with me please, with the word God, Elohim that is used, which means the God Almighty, the word Lord is the word Jehovah, Jehovah which was basically the Jewish national name of God. And that means the existent or eternal one. The self-existent, I beg your pardon, or eternal one. So when God was speaking here to the children of Israel, giving the, giving the commandments, He was saying that I am the Lord, I am the Lord Jehovah, the self-existent one, the eternal one. I am the Lord thy God, the Elohim, the supreme God Almighty, and you will have no other gods before me. The same God, in other words, that was speaking to Moses at the burning bush, who was the Elohim, and said, I am that I am, is the same God who gave the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. Who is that God that was giving the Ten Commandments? And who is the God who was the one who was speaking to Moses in the burning bush? Yes, if you read the Spirit of Prophecy, you'll know that was Jesus Christ who was speaking there. So, I have a problem here, or at least uh, the Aaron's have a problem here, because if anything, you are breaking the commandment of God by saying that Jesus is not God when you are saying that when you break, when, when you worship the Trinitarian God, which of course we don't do because we don't worship the Catholic Trinitarian God, that you are actually breaking the, the first four commandments. Now it gets, it gets more interesting than that. Because, you'll remember, of course, in the book of John, chapter 8, verses 58, Jesus speaks to the children of Israel. Just to make it clear, that you don't need the spirit of prophecy to understand this. The Bible, I mean, it's nice, the spirit of prophecy puts it more clearly, but the Bible itself just explains this. The Greek word that is used for Jehovah is the word ego I mean, that I am. And um, in Exodus 3, verses 14, when Jesus, when, when Jesus, of course, essentially, God spoke to Moses at the burning bush and said, I am that I am, Jesus was essentially, when he was speaking in John 8, verse 58, speaking about the same I am that was at the burning bush. When he quoted to the children of Israel, he said, Verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus was telling us, yes, I am the one who gave the Ten Commandments. I am the one who was in the burning bush. I am the self-existent Lord God Almighty, the Eternal One. In other words, in every sense of the word, Jesus is absolutely equal in His dignity and status as the Father is. There is not that the Father is more God and that Jesus is lesser God. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, that He was created but that he is absolutely equal with God. And what happened when Jesus said that? What happened when Jesus said that I am? They wanted to stone him to death. And Ellen White, remember we quoted that earlier on, Ellen White said, because he had proclaimed himself to be Jehovah, the self-existent one, and they knew what he was talking about because they knew that he was saying, I am God Almighty. That's why they wanted to kill him. And so I'm wondering today, if Jesus came to this world and claimed these things in front of those who are teaching the Aryan doctrine, if they might want to stone him to death as well. Quite possibly so, yes. In fact, just a few statements by Ellen White. She says in Signs of the Times, May 3, 1899, she says, Jehovah is the name given to Christ. Stated absolutely clearly. And then she says in Patriarchs and Prophets, she says, Jehovah, the eternal, self-existent, uncreated one, himself the source and sustainer of all, is alone entitled to, to supreme reverence and worship. It is interesting that very often Ellen White uses this terminology interchangeably between the Father and the Son because they are exactly the same in status and dignity. He has an interesting one with reference to the fourth commandment. Ellen White's statement that she writes in Desire of Ages. Listen very carefully on page 288. She says, Wherefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. These words are full of instruction and comfort because the Sabbath was made for man. It is the Lord's day. It belongs to Christ because he was the one that gave the command, that said the seventh day is the Sabbath. 
And then it goes on to say, for all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. By the way, she's quoting uh, John chapter 1, verses 3 here. That all things were made by him, and nothing was made without him. Now, what does it mean? I mean, again, this is simple English. When something says all, everything was made by him, all things were made, that means nothing was made without him. Surely that means that if he was created and something was created before him or somebody created him, then he is not the one who created all things because he had to find life from somewhere else. But it says all things were made by him. And then she goes on to say, since he made all things, he made the Sabbath. By him it was set apart as a memorial for the work of creation. It points to him as both the creator and the sanctifier declares that he who created all things in heaven and in earth so not only in earth, but in heaven as well, he created all things, and by whom all things are actually held together, is the head of the church, and that by his power we are reconciled to God. For speaking of Israel, he said, I gave my Sabbaths, now this is going back to the Old Testament to Ezekiel, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord Jehovah, the self-existent one, who sanctifies them, who makes them holy. And so, it's very clear that Ellen White saw that Jesus Christ was the one who gave the commandments, and he was the one who was Lord of the Sabbath. Of course, he stated that himself in the New Testament. Now, the evidence, uh, the implica implications of the evidence I've just presented are actually enough to seriously fault the Aryan position. You don't really need much more. It puts a spanner in the works right from the word go. But now listen to some of these other statements by Ellen White. I'd just like to share a few more with you because they are so absolutely clear that you cannot fault them. To save the transgressor of God's law, this is Review and Herald, November 17, 1891. To save the transgressor of God's law, Christ, the one equal with the Father, came to live heaven before men that they might learn to know that it is what it is to have, to have heaven in the heart. Etc. Next statement, which comes to you from Signs of the Times, August 29, 1900, in case you want to write it down. It's also from Evangelism, page 615. Christ is, oh, and I, I highlighted these here for a reason. Because again, when I was giving these seminars, I showed the folk that in the original facsimile articles, because they claim these statements that come out of the book Evangelism were changed. It was never in the original document. But the same statement that is found in Review and Herald is also the statement that is found in... Um, the book Evangelism, and it's exactly the same in the original. There's no difference. So they're building a straw man. Christ is the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. In speaking of his pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. And in fact, I think this is in that statement there. In speaking, in speaking of himself, he carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us that, now listen to this very clearly, that there never was a time when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. So was he there from the very beginning? I mean, you've got to be, you've, you, you've got to be uneducated in, in basic English to actually misunderstand a statement like that. It's saying there never was, never means never. There never was a time when he was not in fellowship with God. And of course, in this case, referring to God the Father. Interesting, too, that she says, this is, this is quite interesting, he to, to whose voice the Jews were then listening when he was speaking about himself being the I am, were listening, had been with God as one brought up, not by him, but as one brought up with him. They were together, in whatever sense, being brought up, if you like, from the very beginning. Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. I've read that statement already. Christ, now this is interesting. Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense. He was with God from all eternity, God over all. So now notice that she uses the terms interchangeably. She was with God, yes, God the Father. But he, then she says, also was God over all, blessed forevermore. God is, the Son is God and the Father is God. You cannot read anything else into that. Christ was, and then she goes on to say, the Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, existed from all eternity, a distinct person, which is in contradiction to what the Catholic belief is on this, yet one with the Father. So in light of these statements and, passage, and Bible passages, it is clear regarding the deity of Jesus Christ. And... Um, 
I mean, you know, I can keep you here for another two hours, in fact, because this is, this is only halfway through the documentation which I have, and this is not even all the documentation that I have on this issue. But um, maybe an interesting statement here that comes from the book Isaiah. You read in Isaiah 9, verse 6, and this is a prophetic statement about Christ, by the way. For unto us a child is born. Uh, I'm going to biblical, the biblical aspect now, not to the spirit of prophecy just for a while. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. It's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. Different titles given to Jesus Christ. The Mighty God, the Counselor, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In fact, the word Father, when you look at what the Hebrew says, it's the word Ab, or Alb, as it is pronounced. Literal or figurative, it can be taken, but it simply means he is the chief or the principal. That's why it describes him as the father. In other words, he is right up there. And if you want to put it in those terms, he is right up there, one with the father. In John 1, verses 1 to 3, we read, and of course the whole chapter of John so clearly describes the Godhead of Christ, but I would just like to take out this segment where it speaks about Jesus as being... Um, the Word was with God in the beginning, and He was God. The Word is quite emphatic. It says not that the Word was just with God, or that He was somebody that happened to be there with God. It says the Word was God. Period. That's what it says. You can't misconstrue the statement. In fact, Ellen White confirms this. Listen to what she says here in Review and Herald, April 5, 1906. She says, The world was made by Him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then she says, if Christ made all things, he existed before all things. The words spoken, in she's speaking about what John wrote, the words spoken in regard to this are so decisive that no one needs to be left in doubt. Christ was God essentially, and in the highest sense, he was with God from all eternity, God over all, and blessed forevermore. What? I mean, how can you misunderstand the language? It is absolutely so clear. The book of Hebrews is so clear. And yet they want to take the book of Hebrews and twist the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, um, into something that it never says. Of course, you, well, let me read the essential text here because this is really what we want to get to. You know what the, the... But unto the Son, the Father, with reference to the Father, it says, Thy throne, O God... This is the Father speaking to the Son, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness, hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. So God, here is referring to the Son as God and Lord, and of course recognizing himself too as being God. Both Father and the Son are God in the highest sense of the word. Interesting segments I can read to you here as well with regards to um, Philippines chapter 2 verse 5 which is one of the arguments that they use. I've just got to decide which ones I'm going to share because I, this could go on for a long time and I want to bore you with this. I'm not that you're bored, I hope not. But I don't want to get into too much of it. I just want to give you the basic outlines or the most important stuff. Um, with reference to Jesus, Philippians 2 verse 5, Paul writes, Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Now the point here that, I'm, that, that, um, that he's made is that Jesus was the one who decided of himself to come down to this world and become, as it were, in the terms, in the words of Paul, to become of no repu reputation. If God the Father only created the world through Christ, and here's some very important part that I want to get to. If God the Father only created the world through Christ, in other words, he's channel for creation because Christ was a created being. Now, maybe before I even deal, deal with that, some believe, as I mentioned, that he was begotten, some believe that it was created. But those who want to use the scripture and say in the air and believe that Jesus was born of God, kind of deny that statement that says he was created. You either have to accept that in some way, if you're going to believe what they believe, that Christ was begotten or created. In other words, he was essentially created in some or other way. And so, if you believe that Jesus Christ was a created being, then you have to basically, when you follow this from cause to effect, basically you have to then say 
that God, in a kind of vicarious way, used Christ as a channel to create the world. And so, in thus doing this, it is not Jesus really the one, the Son, who had the power to create, but the Father gave him the power and created through him. Because after all, God is the one who's the supreme God, who has the power, who's the giver of life, through whom everything, through whom Christ himself came. Okay? But it gets worse than that. If you believe that Jesus Christ is a created being, then the whole plan of salvation falls apart. Because a created being could never have died for the sins of this world. You will remember Ellen White writes about the fact in Patriarchs and Prophets, she writes about it too in a number of other places, that when man had sinned and God and Christ were speaking about the plan of salvation, that they knew what they were going to do, but the angels came and said, look, we'll go. We'll go and die for the sins of the world. And then she made the statement, she said that they could not go because only the one who had created, the one who was not a created being himself could go and die for the sins of this world. So when you say that Jesus is created or was not there eternally with the Father, you are basically making Jesus of non-effect. The whole plan of redemption is under question mark. And that, for me, is a very, very serious issue. In fact, this is why I say when you are going to try and explain things about the Godhead and the nature of God and his existence and everything else, that, that God is not revealed, you are going to get into trouble. Because you are going to be dealing with things that the human mind cannot understand that are absolute mysteries. Ellen White writes about the mystery of the incarnation in Signs of the Times, July 30. She says, in contemplating the incarnation of Christ in humanity, we stand baffled before an unfathomable unfathom, mystery that the human mind cannot comprehend. So how can you comprehend all the other stuff that, we've been, that they are trying to explain in our day and age? In fact, to suggest that Christ is anything other than God, it is not, and I mean other than God in its fullest sense, to suggest that he's anything other than God in the fullest sense is not only blasphemy, it is not only unadventist, but it is at its very core unchristian, and indeed it is anti-Christ. It is antichrist. Essentially, that's what it is. To deny the true status and divinity of Christ is actually to deny the very central pillar upon which Christianity is built. The whole plan of salvation, everything else, is built. upon which, uh, And it is pagan, indeed, in its most specific or definite sense of the word. Yeah, Ellen White makes an interesting statement. She says in 5 Testimonies 173, and I quote, No outward shrines may be visible. There may be no image for the eye to rest upon. Yet, we may be practicing idolatry. But how may we be practicing idolatry? She goes on to explain. It is as easy to make an idol of cherished ideas or objects as to fashion gods of wood or stone. This is the part. Thousands have a false conception of God and his attributes. They are as verily serving a false god as were the servants of Baal. If our understanding of God and his attributes, I'd like to suggest, are what the Aaron's are teaching, we might as well be teach worshipping Baal. Because it is a false concept of who God is. And um, I think that I've covered enough here basically to give us the background into this. Maybe we might want to deal with the Holy Spirit for a moment. And I think one of the things I'd like to just highlight, perhaps before I deal with the, with, the, with the issue of the church being Babylon, because I think that's a very important part. But I'd like to just deal very briefly with the uh, aspect of the Holy Spirit. Now, we do not have, and this must be said very clearly, we do not have that much in the Bible that clearly defines the person of the Holy Spirit. In other words, that clearly says in categorical terms the Holy Spirit is God in the sense of the word that the Father and the Son are. And that the Holy Spirit is not, a, is not just some entity that seems to proceed forth from the Father, some force. But in, in the Spirit of Prophecy, we have some very interesting statements regarding the Holy Spirit that Ellen White makes. I just want to share those with you. And, um, I mean, we could speak about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 6, regarding the Holy Spirit. We could speak about what um, we read in John chapter 10, verses... Uh, what we read in um, sorry, Matthew 3, verses 16, at the baptism of Christ, where the three uh, persons of the Godhead are present. But I think that the, the statements that Ellen White make are fairly comprehensive and fairly clear. So I want to share from 
manuscript 66, 18, 99, also found in the book Evangelism, and this is a problem with those who teach the, uh, teach the Aryan point of view, because they say Ellen White never said this, but you will find it in the original manuscript, which is manuscript 66. This is what she says. Speaking to the students at Avondale, she says, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. And then she went on to explain the rest of what she was trying to tell them about the problems that they were facing at Avondale. But basically she was saying that the Holy Spirit is as much a person as God is a person. Again, in manuscript 20, 1906, she says, the Holy Spirit is a person, for he beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. When this witness is born, he, it carries with it its own evidence. At such times we believe, um, at such times we believe and are sure that we are the children of God. Also found in the book Evangelism 616. Of course, the highlight of that statement is the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person. Then she goes on to say, in a special testimony series A, number 10, page 3, uh, page 37, 1897, also in the book Evangelism, she says, the, she says that the Holy Spirit has a personality. Now that's an interesting, he's not just a person, he has a personality, or else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. Again, she writes in special testimonies, the, sp the prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit, uh, 20 manuscript, uh, 324, she says, the Holy Spirit is the comforter in Christ's name. He personifies Christ, yet is a distinct personality. So is the Holy Spirit a person? Does the Holy Spirit have a personality? Yes, he's not just some force. He has. Now, for me to try and describe, or for any of us to try and describe exactly what shape or biological status, and I use again that, that term very carefully, but what biological state the Holy Spirit has, I cannot do that. It's a mystery to me. How can he be in all things and yet be a, a personality and, if you like, an individual and a person? I don't understand that, but I do know that the light we have been given, and it is in clear, plain English, that he is a person and that he has a personality. And I, that's enough for me. I don't want to try and explain more than what the Bible actually tells me to explain. That is enough. I accept it. And so finally, I'd like to deal with these issues of the church being Babylon. There's much, much more we could speak about plural, plurality texts in the Bible. At the, creation of, at the creation, God speaks and he says, let us make man in our image. Who was he speaking to? Was he speaking to the heavenly council that existed of angels? No, they were not part of the creation council. In fact, that's one of the reasons why Lucifer rebelled was because he couldn't be part of the council. So God, who is he speaking to? No doubt he's speaking to the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image. There are interesting texts as well. Maybe I'm, I'm, oh, you know, I'd love to highlight some of these, actually. I'll, I'll just pick out some of the really significant ones here and highlight them for you. Um, at the Tower of Babel, in Genesis chapter 11, verses 7, the Lord's response to the building of the Tower of Babel, he says, go to, let us go down and confound their language. In Isaiah 6, verses 8, also I have heard the voice of my Lord saying, whom will I send and who will I go for us? And then, of course, Isaiah responds and he says, here I am, send me. So here we see there is not just one aspect to the Godhead, there is a plurality aspect involved. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 24, the concept of union between, this is now union, a unity, if you like, of oneness, if you like, between a plurality of, of forms, is spoken of here. God said that the man and the woman were to become one flesh. Now, the term that is used there in the Hebrew is the word echad. And it is interesting to notice that the term echad means or suggests distinct parts, a plurality situation. Moses could have used the term yachid when he wrote this. And yachid means just specifically only one, only one unique aspect. But he chose to use the term echad. And in Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, but he uses the term echad, which means, suggests a plurality. The Father and Son are one. In John 10 verses 30, I and my Father are one. Now, what did that mean? That they were one being blended together? No, but they were one in status. And for, for saying that, of course, the Jews wanted to stone him to death. Um, some other interesting text that they use as an argument, too, 
And this is the concept of being the firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn of the creation of God. We read that in Colossians uh, 1 verses 15. And so they say, there you have it. Jesus was born of God. But that, does not des- that is not designating his biological status. That is telling you one of the roles that Jesus played, he, the role of the firstborn of God. In fact, let's, let's, let me read it here because I think I wrote this in much clearer terms than I can actually explain. It is not the first time in the Bible where this concept is used. For example, David, who being a type of Christ, was called by God my firstborn. Was he the firstborn of God? No, as far as biological status was concerned, he was the youngest of the house of Jesse. But he was the firstborn of God because it represented a particular role that God was designating. And then, of course, we speak about the heavenly trio. Ellen White writes something here. These are the final statements I will share on this before I go to the church being Babylon, supposedly. Um, There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. How do you like that? This comes from um, Special Testimonies, Series B, number 7, page 62, 63, 905. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. She almost used the word trinity. Thankfully, she didn't. But that gives you the idea that Ellen White believed in a trio in the Godhead. There are three heavenly persons in the heavenly trio in the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Jesus Christ by living faith, are baptized. So he writes in manuscript 145, 1901, the eternal heavenly dignitaries, how many are there? She's using a plural form, yeah? Dignitaries, not dignitary. The eternal heavenly dignitaries, God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, arming them, the disciples, with more than mortal energy, will advance them with, uh, advance with them to do the work and to convince the world of sin. Again, she writes in Manuscript 145, 1901, it's also found in a a few other places as well. We are to cooperate with the three highest powers in heaven. So which one's the highest? It doesn't say that, she doesn't make a qualification. Well, the Father's the highest, the Holy Spirit then next, there's a difference. No, she says the three highest powers in heaven we are to cooperate with, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three powers will work through us. And then let's just read this final statement by her regarding this issue in the great controversy. Rejection of the deity is a fatal mistake. She says, If men reject the testimony of the inspired scriptures concerning the deity of Christ, listen to this very carefully. And by the way, when, you can, when, when somebody speaks to you and tries to argue with you, explain this issue with, uh, to you of the Trinity and Arianism and all this stuff, don't get into a discussion. It's not worth it. Because once they believe this, they believe it, and there's not much you can do. I've discovered this in my own experience. But listen to what she says, though, and this is something we can take into account. If men reject the testimony of the inspired scriptures concerning the deity of Christ, it is in vain to argue the point with them. For no argument, however conclusive, could convince them. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 14. None who hold this error can have a true conception of the character and mission of Christ or of the great plan of God for man's redemption. And all these things are put into question when you start believing this doctrine of Arianism. And then finally, because this happens to be a result of some of the teachings that are going around regarding the Trinity, the result being that they finally call the church Babylon and that we have become like the Catholics. Finally, let's share with you what Ellen White did say about the Seventh-day Adventist church and its supposed um, qualification for becoming Babylon at some other point in time. Let all be careful. Testimonies um, to ministers, page 50, 58, 59, 1893. Let all be careful not to make an outcry against the only people who are fulfilling the description given of the remnant people, who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. My brother, if you are teaching that the Seventh-day Adventist church is Babylon, you are wrong. Another interesting one. The Lord has not given you a message to call the Seventh-day Adventist church Babylon and to call the people of God to come out of her. All the reasons you may present cannot have weight with me on this subject. 
because the Lord has given me decided light that is opposed to such a message. This matter has been brought before my mind in other cases where individuals have claimed to have the message for the Seventh-day Adventist Church of a similar character, and the word was given me, do not believe them. I have not sent them, and yet they have run. They have ran. There are many different occasions, different ones. She says, I warned Seventh-day Adventist Church to be careful how you receive every new notion and those you claim to have great light. The character of their work seems to be to accuse and to tear down. My brother, I would say to you, be careful. Go not one step farther in your path you have not entered, you have entered upon. Walk in the light while you have light, lest darkness come upon you. This was written to a brother who was called in the church Babylon. My brother, you have deceived yourself and have deceived others. You have not searched the scriptures in the right way. You must search them to learn my, the mind of God, not to prove your theory. You read the word of God. Uh, this is basically with regards to reading the word of God to prove a theory so that you can basically um, twist the word of God to make it say what you want it to. And perhaps this one here is a very good one. She says, although there are evils existing in the church. And by the way, we spent this weekend talking about some of those issues and problems. But although there are evils existing in the church and will be until the end of the world, the church in these last days is to be the light of the world that is polluted and demoralized by sin. The church, enfeebled and defective, needing to be reproved, warned and counseled, is the only object upon which, on earth upon which Christ bestows his supreme regard. And this is in context of a meeting that she had with the brethren where she was speaking about this whole issue of the church being Babylon. She said, no, it is not. It is the object upon which Christ bestows his supreme regard. So I'd like to, uh, that statement, of course, I read as well um, in light of some of the other things we have been sharing because everything I've shared with you is not at all to call the church Babylon. It is just to call us back to the foundations of our truth and to show, uh, to, to help us to be faithful to that which God has given us. I don't know, I hope that helps in some other way. There's so much more that I could share on this particular issue. But, yeah, as I say, we could be here for a very long time going through that. I want to say one or two words about the last presentation. Because this last presentation really brings us back to the final found, the foundation of our faith. What is God calling us to? What type of witness are we meant to be at the end of time? Is there something that we can learn from the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy that clearly shows to us, gives us an absolutely clear picture, the, the way in which we should conduct our ministry, the way in which we should present ourselves to the world out there? Not the things we were looking at earlier on. Those were the ways in which God, the things that God was trying to say to us, that is not the way to go. But what is it then that we are meant to do? And that is what our final closing seminars. In fact, for me, that is the most important thing, because the best way to reveal error is to reveal the truth. 